government policy. Carolyn Atkinson and Olivier Blanchard here as discussants of today's themes and of Marco's book. Just a word of opening. Marco Budi is one of the most distinguished uh, public servants in the international scene in the economic sphere. He's currently chief of staff for the EU Commissioner for the Economy, Paolo Gentiloni, and prior to that was Director General for Economic and Financial Affairs of the European Commission between 2008 and 2019, obviously the years that spanned these two crises. He's been the Commission Finance Deputy at the G7, G20, that's a Sherpa, um, like our colleague Carolyn, um, and has also maintained his academic standing, being a visiting professor at various universities in Europe. He's published extensively on the economic and monetary union, political economy of European integration, macroeconomic policies. Um, the book, The Man Inside an European Journey Through Two Crises, is a history book. It's a personal memoir on substance. But I think importantly also, it demonstrates something that Marco has displayed in previous presentations at the Institute and in his public life, the ability to learn, to respond, to engage with economic argument. And I think in today's world of politics, where there's a lot of understandable and somewhat justified criticism of technocrats, the way that Marco, his predecessors, DG Ekpen, um, Klaus Regling, now at the European Stability Mechanism, and other colleagues in the European Commission have genuinely moved their policy views as evidence has accrued, as international discussion has accrued, is really exemplary. Um, and so we're, today's event is mostly about the substance, um, but I also, in the substance, I want people to notice what it's like and get some sense of what policymaking of people of good faith trying to do the right thing looks like. Uh, similarly, later this week, we're going to have an event with not one, but two Federal Reserve Bank presidents simultaneously um, from Fed San Francisco at uh, Mary Daly and Fed Richmond, um, Tom Barkin. What is important there again is there's gonna be substantive discussion of policy, but also a, a insight into how policy genuinely gets discussed and that people do take ideas seriously, at least some of our colleagues in the policymaking space. In that regard, we could not have better discussions of Marco's book and of the two crises than Carolyn Atkinson and Olivier Blanchard. Carolyn Atkinson is an international economist and former policymaker in the US and the UK. She is, I'm proud to say, a member of the Peterson Institute Board of Directors and our executive committee. And she's currently a senior advisor to Rock Creek Investment Firm. Importantly, she served as President Barack Obama's Deputy National Security Advisor for Econo International Economics, meaning she was the U.S. Sherpa at G7, G20 summits, and during that tenure worked on the global crisis and also worked with Marco Budi. She's previously held senior roles at the IMF, the U.S. Treasury, and the Bank of England. Olivier Blanchard, of course, is the C. Fred Bergston Senior Fellow at the Peterson Institute and the Robert M. Solo Professor of Economics Emeritus at MIT. Um, a staunch European, a citizen of France, he spent, Olivier has spent most of his professional life in the U.S. And importantly for today's discussion, he also uh, was in the arena uh, as Chief Economist, um, as Economic Counselor and Director of the Research Department of the IMF from 2008 to 2015, at which point he joined us at Peterson. So with that, this is all on the record and this is all going to, I think, be fascinating. Marco, over to you, please. Many thanks, uh, many thanks, Adam. Uh, this is great, great being here. Um, actually, I had, uh, I had the temptation to postpone this uh, to be there in person, but then eventually, uh, considering the uncertainty we are in, uh, um, you know, I decided to get with you to, to do it online and on the list, but I think it's a, it's a great opportunity having, as you said, uh, Caroline and Olivier uh, as discussants, two uh, good friends that uh, we have crossed paths uh, many times in the past. So I think uh, uh, it is, uh, I mean, they are ideally placed to, you know, offer and add to uh, what I'm uh, about to say. I am very grateful to you, Adam, and to Peterson in particular, and to uh, Olivier, because I mean, the idea of uh, this book here was born actually 
uh, in the uh, right in the aftermath of uh, my um, uh, seminar uh, at Peterson back in 2019, when, uh, uh, in a sense, you were so generous to celebrate my, uh, in a sense, uh, 10 years uh, or so as uh, director general and, uh, and, you know, the passing of, uh, of that period uh, uh, when uh, uh, I remember you were in the switchover between uh, the Juncker Commission and the uh, and the new uh, and the new Commission, and I remember um, discussing with Olivier, in particular in the lounge in the airport afterwards. And uh, he had like what I had to say there in the presentation. He suggested to uh, that I would put on paper uh, a bit this uh, uh, such an experience. I have not done exactly that actually. Um, because the book here is, uh, I mean, I bring together uh, a number of contributions that I have given over um, over the years. I try to put in a you know good order and uh, giving it um, you know a proper red line uh, through um, uh, through the book and uh, and with an introduction which gives my own account uh, of uh, uh, let's say the journey through um, uh, two uh, crises. Um, uh, Olivier actually wrote a, uh, uh, an endorsement that is uh, uh, at the beginning of the book, uh, uh, which if I translate in, um, in layman terms, uh, he, does, he does it very nicely and very eloquently. Uh, he said, this is, uh, uh, you are almost foolish to, re to bring back this type of, um, uh, of contributions over the years because it, it is clear that things have evolved and, you know, looking at certain things that one has done uh, some years ago in the heat of the moment um, may not always be very comfortable. Uh, so, okay, I took the risk and uh, let's see what, uh, uh, what you all uh, think about it. So, I mean, very specific, let's say, uh, origin and roots of this work uh, into the Peterson uh, um, uh, Institute. Now, I think the, what uh, uh, one can certainly um, conclude uh, already at this stage, while we are still in itinerary, is that the, um, the response uh, to the crisis, uh, the European response to the crisis uh, uh, of, uh, of the pandemic uh, in economic policy terms has been substantially different than the one uh, during the, the financial crisis. Um, I have to say that if you look at the, and I show it to you, uh, if you look at the, uh, um, uh, the book cover, uh, you will see, maybe as if, if you are able to see it, there is a compass uh, here and there is a fragile Euro little uh, paper boat over it. And I think I, I actually have chosen the cover myself. So usually you get the publisher imposing. Uh, so you know, here I, I found it, my, I chose myself. And I think it captures a bit the essence of the experience during the, uh, during the financial crisis, especially, uh, especially at the beginning. We were literally without a compass. Uh, certainly for a long time and throughout the financial crisis without an agreed compass. And you see the little boat of the euro uh, hanging over the, uh, uh, over the compass in a very you know, fragile uh, um, situation. Uh, so that is, in a sense, it captures very much uh, what uh, we experienced during the financial crisis. And I still remember um, I mentioned it in the past, when uh, go, you go back to two th uh, 2010, uh, 2011, and uh, Caroline was there uh, at the time, we had, you know, live coverage by CNN on the Euro, uh, on the Euro crisis, you know, as if, you know, like when you have to take a uh, hostage taking or, uh, or uh, you know, an attack uh, of uh, Taliban in some part of the world, you know. So as if the euro would not actually survive till the next day on the ne or the next uh, in the next week weeks. So the kind of response that was uh, um, uh, put in place at the time, I mean, reflected very much this uh, you know existential threat that we had to we had to face. So if I if I look at monetary fiscal structural policies at the time and institutional choices. 
they were motivated largely by a survival instinct huh? and the need, I think, to, uh, uh, you know, to overcome an immediate uh, and present danger. Um, so the interplay between these policies, if you take the policy mix, uh, uh, taking monetary, fiscal and structural policies, uh, it was more of a strategic, the strategic interactions rather than what economists would uh, actually uh, like to see, uh, which is a con more congruent uh, uh, policy mix. Strategic interaction in the sense that to give, you know, to give more leeway to monetary policy, you have to have, uh, you know, fiscal, uh, fiscal restrictions and the, and the fiscal compact, fiscal compact also in order to have the ESM as crisis management. Uh, so this was, uh, I mean, the uh, experience at the time, and you go back to 2015 with the threat of exiting um, uh, by Greece, uh, and so uh, uh, calling to question the integrity of the Eurozone, you know, very much the same logic uh, applied. So why have we responded in a different way to the present crisis? Uh, I think there are essentially three reasons. Uh, okay, the first one, I believe, is the different nature of the crisis. So what we had uh, during the financial crisis was very much tainted by moral hazard considerations. So it was, in a sense, seen as policy-induced. And the fact that uh, Greece was the first one to come to the fore gave an added element, which was, uh, you know, fiscal lenses. Uh, through interpreted the crisis. So there was an element of, of bias, which I think is not correct from the point of view of interpreting the, the nature and the origin of the financial crisis. So, but that this element here, when you add moral hazard considerations, then leads to, to, to a type of uh, um, interactions, which are very much of the strategic uh, type that I mentioned before. Today's crisis is exogenous, um, it, so, so it is, uh, is not, uh, one cannot apply moral hazard considerations to this, uh, to this crisis. I think this was an important element in uh, um, you know, motivating a different response. I think the second reason is the learning that we have. And here I look at Caroline, um, because what they, they, I mean, I have to say, also as finance deputy of the commission at the time, I think we worked very well with the U.S. Uh, um, and uh, with the U.S. I remember Caroline and Lel Brainerd, um, uh, and the interplay there was, uh, in a sense, we we had a, part, a degree of partnership in certain cases, also helping to remove some obstacle on the European side. Mm -hmm. So I think that was, uh, it was, uh, I think, a, a very fruitful, uh, I mean, I, I, I let you to comment on uh, what happened in the past four years. I think the interplay was a bit less smooth uh, than, uh, than at the time. Uh, I closed I close the bracket. So I think the elemental learning and, and I think working with the US and, and Caroline and colleagues, I think was very, um, very, um, you know, helpful on, on that front. And then the third element is what we learn in macroeconomics. And here I look at uh, Olivier. That's why these two uh, discussions here I ideally placed because Olivier was, I think, uh, um, in his previous capacity uh, as chief economist of the fund, uh, you know, the, all, the whole work on, uh, you know, multipliers, the effect of fiscal policy at the effective lower bound, uh, et cetera, I think has been clearly a landmark uh, in, you know, moving forward uh, the uh, um, the debate. So these are the reasons why we have, I think, responded in a different uh, way. We have uh, uh, um, next generation EU beside, uh, on top of uh, the what the, the ECB uh, has done. So the PEP uh, program uh, and the, you know the courageous monetary uh, policy uh, by the European Central Bank, um, other measures uh, at the national level which have been favored uh, by the fact that we uh, loosened, actually suspended the rules of the Stability and Growth Pact. So giving way to the member states to respond uh, by uh, an exp expansion of fiscal policies and then the central fiscal capacity the next generation EU. This is so central that I would like to just end 
with one slide that I would uh, uh, that I would share with you. Uh, can you see it? Uh, not know. yet. Not yet. Not yet. Okay, then I have to go back. Sorry. Okay, let me share. And it is here. Okay, hopefully that works. Hopefully you can see it now. Uh, that works. Okay, and here, okay, then this is next generation U, and the core of that, you know, basically 90% is the recovery and resilient facility. Um, so, uh, uh, next generation U 750 plus uh, um, uh, billions in uh, grants and, and loans. And here I try to articulate a bit in a, let's say, in a synthetic way why it is so central to lo look in, looking at the future. So basically, uh, the first one is um, the debate that we are having now. Again, uh, Olivier contributed substantially to that, is on the reform of the fiscal rules. Uh, so I think what we are doing on uh, um, the uh, recovery and resilience facility in terms of governance and interplay with the member states, I think with their uh, plans to uh, of, uh, um, recovery and resilience, I think can inspire the reform of the uh, stability uh, and growth pact. Uh, the implementation also of the um, RRF could, could uh, in the medium term, certainly not uh, immediately, I think um, reopen the discussion on a permanent fiscal capacity. So the um, uh, so the, the uh, stabilization uh, function at the central level or the higher supply of uh, European public goods and this element of trust, if the implementation is correct is uh, right, I think could could indeed enhance in trust and and help in the debate on the reform of the Stability and Growth Pact, help overcome the, uh, you know, the, the typical ideological positions in which member states uh, paint themselves uh, in, this, uh, in this discussion. Um, if you look at the uh, double transition uh, here, so of the um, uh, resources of recovery and resilient facility, at least 37% will have to go for the green transition, at least 20% for the digital transition. So I think helping, uh, you know, the double transition, helping Europe to move on a, a higher um, and sustainable growth model. Uh, so here you have the, uh, let's say, the, um, the growth element uh, that uh, I think looks at the future. And finally, uh, you have also the geopolitical uh, uh, dimension because the, the double transition as well as uh, the issuance of uh, safe asset uh, helping the international role of the euro could actually help to establish uh, the geopolitical uh, role of, uh, uh, of Europe and a permanent fiscal capacity eventually would actually buttress that kind uh, of role. I finish here, Adam. Um, simply with one uh, final consideration. Uh, at the end of the introduction, uh, I draw some um, uh, general lessons on, uh, uh, let's say, on how uh, policy coordination, economic policy making, institutional relations uh, run in Europe. And one conclusion that I have there uh, is that in Europe, to go from A till B is never a straight line. Mm -hmm. And actually, if you attempt to take the straight line, is sometimes uh, the best way not to, to, get, uh, to get from A till B. So these elements here, which are on the double transition and on the geopolitical role uh, of Europe, are actually new dimensions, which I think politically can help remove obstacles that you have on the left-hand side of the chart. Uh, so that would be a bit the way of, uh, you know, looking at an adult EU in the in a you know difficult uh, and challenging economic governance, but where the lead would be 
um, on uh, you know showing a model on the double transition, which I think is uh, um, more appealing than uh, other models that we see on global governance right now. I I stop here, Adam. Thanks. Thank you so much, Marco. Um, it's very exciting to see the EU in the economic sphere, as you implied, reaching adulthood. Um, it's 22 years since economic and monetary union, the launch of the Euro. Um, and it obviously, Europe, uh, if you could stop sharing your screen, please. Um, obviously Europe, uh, the European Union, has made a great deal of change in the last few years in this crisis as opposed to the previous one. So in that spirit of both constructive and honest engagement, um, let me now turn to Carolyn Atkinson for her thoughts on working with Europe zigging and zagging. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, first of all, of course, we all zig and zag in the policy world because uh, there are always constraints on uh, political constraints on what economics is thinking about. So I just want to make uh, five points, which I'll adjust slightly because of uh, Marco's great presentation. The first one is, as he and Adam have pointed out, that I have looked at all of this from an American viewpoint. Early, early on, I was uh, in the International Monetary Fund, uh, the division chief and mission chief for Italy, Portugal, and Greece during the ERM crisis. So I had some familiarity with uh, both with uh, Brussels surveillance, which we coordinated closely then, but in less transparent times behind, uh, without being in, on CNN or anything else. Uh, but mostly my engagement, certainly during the crises, was as an American policymaker and also as an American political policymaker in the sense that I was in the White House. I was the economics advisor, international economics advisor, but to a president. And that leads me to uh, my next point. What I picked up very strongly from Marco's book uh, was the tension that there always was between, and always is maybe, between politics and leadership and national considerations and the common interest. And uh, you talk about you know, intergovernmental versus union uh, resolutions during, uh, and, and processes during the crisis, during the European crisis. And early on in the crisis, it certainly felt from my perspective as if the um, commission itself was a drag on policy making and not a spur to change. And I have to say, as uh, echo what Adam says and what your forward and you know Adam Tooze and uh, Mar Martin Sanbu say in your uh, book, Marco, that you were extremely open and honest and uh, and also found time to write so much and think so much, which is particularly impressive when I think back to our own intellectual work at the time, uh, which always was very uh, rushed uh, in, in the White House. But this, um, the mistakes that were in your view, in my view, were made on fiscal policy, I think represented uh, an imbalance of power at the national level. And of course that played out as creditors and debtors uh, between Germany in the north and uh, Greece and Italy in the south. But it was also uh, a failure to, on all of our parts, to convince Germany essentially uh, and the other northerners of the room and the need and the importance of uh, allowing for the debtors not to be sort of uh, buried in austerity. And I think that uh, analysis from the commission and an openness to the push that was always coming at least from the United States maybe not from uh, from within Europe and not from the IMF so much, but there was always a push coming from the United States, the government, but also outside the government to consider 
uh, a more relaxed fiscal stance and less um, punitive austerity. Maybe if the Commission had switched and really argued carefully with uh, national leaders, that could have changed things. I don't know. But in the uh, conversation that I remember very clearly in the spring of 2012, at the time of May 2012, at the G8 summit that was hosted by the Americans, um, President Obama pulled together the four key leaders that were there of the uh, of EMU, um, or rather the three, Germany, France, and Italy, and not the commission, and not the commission president, and not the UK, to try to talk about the damage that, the red lines that would need to be crossed if, if, uh, if dissolution of the euro was allowed. And, um, and that may have been unfair on our part not to include the commission in, but certainly there was a sense that Germany was driving where the commission was. And we then saw, of course, the development of the intergovernmental uh, procedures, which again were very dominated by Germany, uh, maybe even more so than the commission work, but uh, with the ESM. So I think for you, Marco, you were probably squeezed on both sides, as you say in your in your book. The creditors thought you were too soft. The debtors thought you were too tough. And maybe that means you were doing what you could. Um, so my third point is that reading it, I was very struck by, and you sort of go through the chronology a few times from the different angles. So, but really, apart from this big uh, tension between national or government intergovernmental and union and common policy there is a focus on emu which is understandable but doesn't cover all of the e all of the eu so i'm very curious as to how you see that does surveillance all have to be about emu and keeping the uh, and keeping the common currency together uh, which obviously then involves the ecb and not just the european uh, institutions, the uh, fiscal and monetary. Um, I also noted that there was not so much about Brexit, and maybe that's appropriate as well, but I do think that Brexit was partly a cost of the mistakes that we all made in not in enforcing too much austerity or not enough support. My fourth point is just on an external representation. I'm not sure that you get that satisfactorily for Europe through uh, through the EC, through the development of the euro. I actually think that political representation and geopolitical representation will come more through other policies than monetary policies. I think the ECB already has massive standing as one of the you know maybe the second most important central bank in that community and um, it's shown a lot of flexibility. So I think that for geopolitical discussions, it's really uh, having a more unified and maybe that's the Eurozone Treasury or or a stronger commission. I also think, and this is maybe a little bit of a nitpick, but it's very awkward for the non-Europeans in terms of representation that there are so many Europeans at the table. And I know one solution, this obviously applies in the IMF, and has been a, a, a hindrance to some reform there, but also is in the G7. Um, it's a bit different now that the UK has left, but uh, it used to be very striking. The G7 actually included um, three non-European countries, Canada, the US and Japan, and then a lot of Europeans, including two central represent representatives, the EU, uh, the Commission President and the Council President. and. That sort of inevitably, I think, uh, sort of doesn't help with a with a single view, and so that's you know that's another uh, complication of the importance of the council. My last point is, and Olivier, I'm sure we'll talk about this, but uh, I was very much pushing for a looser fiscal policy and a better balance between fiscal and monetary policy at the time of the after the financial crisis, and at the early stage of the pandemic. And I think it's fantastic 
the response that Europe had at the early stage of the of the pandemic and really shows the the learning, as you put it. I am now worried, of course, that uh, we have inflation. It's worse in the US, but it's also noticeable in Europe. I wonder how long Germany will be satisfied and will allow uh, what's going on to continue. Maybe with the new government, it will be a bit different. Maybe inflation will go away. But that is obviously a big macro question. And then on the non-macro questions, uh, you talk about um, climate and digital. I, Of course, climate is huge. I think the other challenges that we all will need to face in a strong European voice will be important. Obviously, the pandemic, we all got reminded in the last few days, if we've forgotten, that COVID is here, that it's not being dealt with properly on a global basis. I. I I'm very sad that the US is not taking a, a, a better line uh, with Europe on vaccinating the rest of the world, um, never mind ourselves. There is also the big issue of migration, which is obviously a problem for Europe and between Europe and the UK, but it's also a huge issue here. How do we think about that? And then trade, where you do have clear central competence, where there is a big threat to uh, to you know free trade and where I think a strong European voice uh, can be helpful. But again, you may get uh, you you may find that difficult with the US as you argue over things like uh, chlorinated chickens and uh, and uh, uh, other issues. And then finally, the big issue is how do we approach uh, China and 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 uh, other non-democracies as well as in the US how do we remain a democracy so I think on all of those big issues having a strong European voice is going to be essential and figuring out how that voice is articulated between a commission in Brussels and the strong big players is going to be important but you I don't think you can get I think you have to work with those strong big players national players and not think that they will fade away. Thanks. Thank you so much, Carolyn, for integrating the personal experience, the ideas, and the forward-looking, as Marco also tried to do. I just want to remind our audience that registered uh, attendees, virtual attendees, may post questions to Marco and both our discussants using the Q&A function on Zoom. Please feel free to do so, and I will gather them and post them to our panel after the next set of remarks, which are those from Olivier Blanchard. Olivier. Good, very happy to be here. Uh, the first thing to say, I think it's a very impressive and, and courageous book. Uh, impressive because the ability to write serious pieces, and we see something like Caroline, Caroline said, uh, at the same time as being involved in policy to the degree that Marco was, is, is exceptional. Uh, I really, uh, I, I enjoyed uh, many of them in real time. Uh, enjoy is not always the word. I reacted to a number of them in real time, but um, seeing them retrospectively is, is incredibly useful. The courageous part is that, in, as Marco said in his intro, uh, I mean, he didn't try to rewrite history. He basically gave history and, and, and it shows, I mean, it shows in the, in the sense, you, you see how Marco is evolving uh, through time uh, in, 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 in many ways. That's incredibly honest, it's refreshing. And I really enjoyed that part of the, of the, of, of the, the part of that book. Uh, I think indeed the, the theme for me, the theme is uh, change of the time you know, how basically the uh, European Commission, Marco, the European Commission, the European Union itself, have moved over time. Uh, and, and it's clear that Marco has has moved, I mean, from the discussion of what was done in Greece, what was done on, on fiscal, it is very striking. I mean, I really enjoyed very much the set of chapters on fiscal policy, which basically start in 2012 and end in 2016 for the most part. Uh, I mean, it really starts with, uh, with, with a German view of things that that is bad and debt reduction is it. And then at the end, it's, uh, I have the impression of hearing myself. Uh, it's Keynesian, uh, you know, you have to worry about demand. Uh, debt stabilization may not work, not only in terms of output, but even in terms of debt, debt stabilization, 
and uh, I must say I enjoyed it. But I, I, I very much respect uh, what you know the honesty of Marco along uh, Marco along the way, and and the fact that he's willing to put it on the table. Um, that's really a, a major plus. Uh, the, the important question is uh, is not whether Marco has moved, which is very good for Marco. Is it's how much the European Commission and the European Union have moved. Do they have moved? Have they moved in tandem? Uh, with Marco or, or not, there is absolutely no question that uh, that they have reacted very differently to the two crises, and I think that's a fundamental uh, contribution of the book. Uh, and the question is, uh, is 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 why? And here I'm going to actually uh, I have prepared remarks which are, turn out to be very similar to the way Marco presented things, so it's going to be a bit uh, overlapping and and repetitive, but maybe it gives more credibility or credence uh, to, 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 to my conclusions and his. In the first one, he said there was, uh, you know, we went into it without a compass. I'm not sure that, uh, and then he actually changed the sentence. It said with, with an agreed compass. I think there was a clear view uh, of what should be done, which was not the right one, but was clear, it was a compass. It pointed in the wrong direction. The, the first one was that there was fixation, and that's actually something that Marco has emphasized both in the book and his presentation. There's a fixation on moral hazard. It's kind of looking at everything that people do through the lens of moral hazard, and therefore being incredibly reluctant to reward anybody for anything or protect anybody from anything exposed because they, they had misbehaved uh, in the first place. The second was uh, it's related, but it's not quite the same. A deep mistrust among countries, across countries, and they came from the nature of a crisis. But clearly, there was uh, the North versus the South, and the North just did not trust the South in any way. They had misbehaved, and if you gave them any flexibility, they were going to misbehave more, and therefore you had a need for really tight walls, and that was, I think, uh, fairly fundamental. I, mean, I remember the first. Uh, program uh, for Greece actually had a, an interest rate which was higher than the market and the idea was to punish. Uh, that went away fairly quickly um, but it does I think that it was a fundamental aspect of, of the crisis. Uh, the third one was what I would call uh, maybe, uh, maybe jokingly but not so much the German view of macro. The German view of macro is all supply side. It's basically, you know, if the economy is not doing well, you do structural reforms and look, we've done them and they work and therefore everybody should do the same thing. This demand stuff, this Keynesian stuff really was not popular in Germany. I don't think it was even understood. And so there was an insistence always on, well, they have to do structural reforms and the list of reforms that the countries were asked to do, I mean, Greece being the worst example, uh, went far beyond what was politically uh, feasible. And then as Mark was said, in the end, it was not, it was bad. It could have been worse, but faced basically with a precipice, then, you know, things happened. Uh, there was no choice. Uh, what uh, I think Marco has called the survival instinct just came in and we got the ESM and we got a number of things, but they came very late in the process and, and a lot of damage uh, had been done. Now, this one is different in many ways. Uh, and, and I think for some of the reasons that Marco has given, and maybe some others, the first one is nobody misbehaved. I mean, COVID is basically, uh, you know, uh, a universal uh, catastrophe. You know, countries are not uh, more responsible than others. Everybody looking forward, everybody is affected in the same way. And it's not clear that what we think are the good countries have actually done better uh, in terms of fighting COVID. So there's, there's much more of a Wallsian uh, uh, vision which can be applied to the crisis. Nobody is responsible, everybody's facing the, the problem in the same way. There's no North versus South. At some points, actually, the South did better. Germany is doing poorly now. And, and so so it, I think it makes it much easier to come to an agreement. Uh, the third one is that I think the view of Macro really has changed. Uh, maybe it's my desire to, to see that, but I think it has. I think that the Commission in general has more of a balanced view, I would say, some traditional view, some Keynesian aspects, 
And the discussions I think that I've had in the last few years with people at the commission, being Marco or his boss or others, uh, really are very different from the ones that I had uh, <clears throat> during the global financial crisis. And all this has led to, I think, a lot of very good measures and, and Marco and others should be very proud, I think, of what they have done. And the next generation EU is really remarkable in many ways. Um, you know, I think the, there are many aspects. The setting of reforms combined with funds, so one of the arrows in the, uh, in the PowerPoint that uh, Marco showed, basically allowing countries to endorse take responsibility, choose their own reforms within some organized context. But I think it has made an enormous difference. If I think about Italy, it really has helped uh, Mario Draghi a lot in pushing reforms. We'll see which ones actually go through. But it has made it much easier than uh, in the old days, you'll get money if you do this, 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 this and that, um, which, which, was, which was an issue. Uh, the decision to, to do it partly at the European level and then decentralize uh, is, is again, I think, uh, uh, something fundamental because the issues that it deals with mainly, which is global warming, the digital transformation, are really things which have to be done at the European level. It makes no sense for you know France alone to have a climate policy if the others don't have the same one. So I think next gen has use this opportunity to focus on the things which need to be done, or at least tightly coordinated at the European levels. And then the financing aspect, which has been briefly discussed, is also fundamental, which is that if Brussels is going to be in that business, then it can issue bonds, or, you know, the EU can issue bonds. And they, we've seen they sell well, and clearly uh, this, is, this is a very good thing. Now, the question is, what will the Commission and what the European Union do in the next crisis, uh, you know, is it going to be, it's not going to be the way it was, is it going to be the way it is, is it going to be a mix? I think that, again, the view of the economy has changed and that's for, that's for the better and this will last. So I think the macroeconomic aspects, which is clearly what I care most about, uh, will really be different, will be closer to this one. Uh, I think the next generation in you is, is a marvelous proof of concept. Uh, if it works, and I think there are some reasons to think that it will work fairly well, it really says this is the way to do it for the other things, to do it on a bigger scale for global warming, to do it on a bigger scale for digital, to do it on a bigger scale for pandemics. Uh, but there are some issues where the Walsian uh, approach is still not going to work. And I think Caroline mentioned this at the end. And when it comes to migration, then again, some countries are much more affected than others. And then it becomes a bit of, well, we protect ourselves and you do what you, what you need to do. So I think it's going to depend a bit on, on the type of crisis. The type of crisis we may see also is if we have uh, populist parties coming to power and not just from the extreme east, but more from the center. Uh, will the EU be able to not to deal with it, and it's very far from obvious. Um, so I think there has been tremendous progress. A lot of it has been done, has been due to, to Marco himself, uh, but also I think to the commission, which has changed. And uh, again, you should read the book. I really uh, enjoyed it. Uh, it's, it has what I like uh, these, these days, given my impatience. Basically, the pieces are very short. Uh, you know, it's three or four pages at a time. And that makes it much easier for people like me who have no patience uh, to read it. But I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Let me stop here. Thank you, Olivier. Um, we have some very good questions on the function. Thank you for posing them there. Um, Marco, is there any quick response to Olivier and Carolyn you would like to make, or should we go to the no, maybe discussion. maybe a, a quick um, a quick reaction on my part, uh, um, not taking up the uh, the individual comments, but a little, uh, what is common a bit between uh, uh, the two set of uh, um, commentaries. I mean, I think the common thread here is the the continuous tension that we have between the common interest and national politics. Um, and what we have is that um, 
uh, is the typical high political discount rate that politicians have. Uh, so the what counts uh, uh, is is first and foremost uh, your uh, you know national uh, you know public opinion, and the time horizon is the uh, you know the next elections. Uh, to a certain extent, uh, uh, if I may make maybe here a, a comment, is that um, the fact that we decided. Uh, we were able to decide in a very swift manner, in particular, if you take the counterfactual of um, the cumbersome EU decision-making process. So we decide very quickly on uh, next generation EU in 2020. We were, in a sense, blessed by the fact that there was not major elections in looming. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, actually the first one was the first elections uh, uh, was uh, um, in the Netherlands uh, back uh, in March uh, 2021. So they were sufficiently uh, far away from the, uh, uh, you know, from the, the moment in which the decision uh, at the EU level were, were, uh, had to be made, which in a sense was, uh, you know, one had the time to absorb it and uh, even if it's somewhat uh, um, unpopular domestically, which however I qualify again, if one looks, and give, which gives me hope for the future, if one looks at Eurobarometers and other opinion, uh, opinion polls um, in the EU countries, and if you take also in the frugal uh, countries, um, the support for uh, policies related to next generation EU, for, to the supply of European public goods, be it economic or non-economic, is very strong also in those countries, yes, there is a little gap between uh, uh, the overall EU views uh, and uh, the support in the public opinion in these, uh, let's say, in the um, four or five uh, northern countries, but it is still largely prevalent that they want to see more action at the, European, at the European level. So in a sense, what one has to do here, in a sense, is to try to align the preferences of the governments with those of the public opinion, uh, actually, which is uh, which are more forthcoming than uh, uh, what we see sometimes in in uh, political in political debates. The um, I mean, what prevailed during the financial crisis, and I agree with a number of, of uh, uh, critical comments uh, that uh, Caroline uh, offered. I think was the fact that we had teared apart. Raoul's veil of ignorance. It was clear who was going to win and who was going to lose from the, from the crisis. When, I mean, when you try to make reforms under those conditions where it is clear who is the loser, who is the winner, then you get to a pretty biased uh, outcome eventually. Now, if I jump to today, I think one of the elements of COVID, on the, and, and we see it, we see it actually, the experience very, very graphic of the past two years. And if one looks to the future and, look, and brings in the geopolitical dimension, and, and uh, Caroline mentioned uh, China here, it is not clear at all who is, who is the loser, who are the losers and who are the winners. And actually, one element which I think is important is that the winners of yesterday may become the losers of tomorrow uh, and uh, you know countries and the eurozone as a whole uh, um, with uh, large dependence on the external dimension and on uh, you know persistent current account surpluses actually are more vulnerable uh, to you know geopolitical vagaries than uh, areas of the world which uh, you know are more you know domestically uh, you know they have a, mo a growth model which is more indigenous uh, let's let's put it like that so I think if one looks to the future of what happens after next generation EU which is uh, let's say a large longish one-off because it is not uh, uh, the way it is conceived now it is not a permanent um, shift. By one looks to the future, I think uh, one can, uh, you know, draw conclusions which are which have to take into account. I mean, these elements of uh, uh, of uh, uh, of change. Um, Thank you, Marco. Um, so let me build on that by uh, conveying a couple of the questions from our audience. 
Athanasio Zarfinides uh, notes, uh, picking up on this whole discussion, Rawlsian discussion, um, the inability of the commission, it seems for the most part to advance policies that support the common good over the interests of specific states. And that in the treaty, the commission has in theory been supposed to be able to act independently. All three of you have touched on variants of this. Um, if there were to be governance reforms in Europe, what recommendations would you make to enhance the independence of the commission? And also I'm going to pull in another question because we're getting close to time and I know Olivier loses patience. Um, Megan Green asks, given the difficulty countries such as Italy and Spain have traditionally had in absorbing cohesion and structural funds from Brussels, how successful do you think absorption of the next generation EU funds will be? So, um, and that obviously has both political and economic implications. So maybe we could just go through Marco, Carolyn, Olivier, thoughts on either of those two topics. What governance changes in EU to have the commission be more independent going forward if you want that? And how does the record of the South, so to speak, absorbing funds from the center inform uh, the next generation EU? How do you think that's gonna go? So Marco, please. Uh, yes, no, um, let me say uh, hello to Athanasius. Uh, he was here uh, last week, I, I believe, for our annual research conference, uh, and we had the ch nice uh, changes uh, at, the mo at the time. Um, now, on the uh, role of the Commission, actually, if you look at the, the introduction of the book, I try to um, uh, analyze there uh, the evolution of the role of the Commission throughout the different uh, throughout the different crises. And actually the element of commission as a referee, uh, the uh, commission as uh, you know, consensus building, uh, consensus building function, I think the commission as a uh, um, center of uh, you know, analytical uh, excellence or let's put it analytical uh, um, robustness, uh, uh, I think is uh, are elements that which I think uh, come all uh, into play. It is clear that the Commission does not operate in a vacuum. And I think trying to operate in a vacuum would actually be an element of weakness, not an element of strength. There are those who want to put the Commission on purely on an analytical uh, corner, uh, painted uh, there and uh, you know, applying the rules regardless. I think that would be an element uh, of uh, uh, weakness, uh, which uh, I think would not serve us uh, uh, well. Um, clearly, operating in uh, in a political environment uh, implies also that one has to take into account uh, what the uh, what the um, relations are in that uh, uh, in that environment. And I think Caroline made a number of points before. I mean, when we came to the uh, um, to to managing the financial crisis, I think we had to. Uh, take into account the fact that uh, these, L, uh, these power relations that uh, was established between North and South, uh, you know, ha had to be reckoned, uh, reckoned with. One uh, could certainly try to move, uh, let's say, the boundaries, and we tried to do so, but within uh, certain limits. When it came to the crunch, I think it was very clear that, uh, I mean, the courage was, institutional courage was there. I just recall one episode, which is the documented uh, uh, or uh, uh, in, uh, recalled in the book, uh, and that was the Greek crisis 2015. There was July 2015, uh, certain suggestions, um, pretty strongly uh, supported, uh, of uh, uh, you know Greek exiting uh, uh, the eurozone, possibly for a period, uh, possibly more uh, permanently, uh, etc. At that time, um, the message that came to the Commission and to the Commission President Jean Claude Juncker was from a number of European leaders: stay out of this. This is for the European Council. Is for the region. Is not for the Commission. I think. At the time, Jean-Claude Juncker decided, no, this is a question related to the integrity of the Eurozone, and it is so encompassing that he, he put his foot down and decided to say, no, 
Euro, uh, Greece is part of the Eurozone and it should remain. So we do not call into question the integrity of, uh, uh, of, of the Euro. So I think that was uh, a certainly a very important contributing factor to maintain the integrity of the Eurozone. And I think if one looks a bit ex post, uh, I think that was the right choice, uh, the right choice uh, uh, to make. Thank you, Marco. Carolyn? Thanks very much. And uh, just quickly, I, I remember, and Marco graciously spoke before, that we coordinated closely on, uh, on that in 2015, trying to pull the various actors to a place where um, they could all agree. And, uh, and that was important coordination. And it was a brave and correct move, in my view, um, from the president. I think it shows, I completely agree with Marco that being just the analytical referee, you know, you get pushed aside because especially in times of crisis, rules need to be changed. The next gen EU is a good way to go forward for governance, but you always do have to take account of politics. I think you, can, the commission can, make progress by pushing the boundaries and being uh, creative and bold about, uh, about those boundaries. One area that's nothing to do with Marco's work, I don't think, but where it was much less successful is on Brexit. There was not an a bit, there was not, and the British of course were terrible, <laughs> but <laughs> there may have been a different outcome if there had been uh, a stronger sense from the commission that what was important was also holding together the non-EMU countries. Anyway, that's uh, looking forward. I think that using the space, which Martin Sandbu put, points out nicely in, in his uh, epilogue, that it's possible sometimes to uh, have that boldness, the intellectual boldness, actually uh, make a difference to the politics. Uh, you have to pay attention to the politics, you have to work on the politicians, but you, it's possible to move those boundaries. And that's the art of uh, policy making, in my view. Fantastic. Thank you, Carolyn. Olivier? Yeah, I'm not enough of an insider to actually have a good sense of how the commission should be modified or is its a mandate. But I've, there's one dimension in which I think something has started to happen and can be very useful. It's on the fiscal rules and the assessment of that sustainability. We now have, I think in most countries, fairly competent uh, national fiscal councils. And it seems to me that an assessment of that sustainability, which is shared, between the Commission and the National Fiscal Councils, either informally, but maybe even formally, will give much more weight uh, to a conclusion that there is an issue. At this stage, when the Commission says there is an issue, then the government says you just don't understand anything. If it's National uh, Fiscal Council said, yeah, we agree with the Commission, there's something to be, uh, which needs to be done, that would actually make a difference. Uh, I think, a big problem of the fiscal rules, in addition to the fact that they were not great, but that they seem to be imposed from the top. And I think it's terribly important to have some uh, national uh, buy-in. Uh, I think- Can I ask, we're, we're sure. almost out of time. Megan Green's question, I think is very apt, uh, both in terms of actual reality and political perceptions about how the South, Southern European economies use funds from the center. And um, the three of you focused on the governance. Could we just get a closing word perhaps from you, Marco, on what you think the use of funds in next generation EU is gonna look like? Is Draghi gonna set an example that makes everyone say, oh great, we'll give lots more money. Um, how do you view that? Yes, Adam, okay. First of all, let me thank all of you. Um, before concluding, I mean, on this point, it is absolutely clear. I think you have seen that uh, uh, in the slide I, I, I showed before, uh, in, in what I have spoke, uh, what uh, I mean, in my arguments before, the trust is absolutely key. Um, a moral hazard uh, is lack of trust, uh, based on lack of trust. And I think next generation EU is an opening of credit, uh, I think, to 
mutual trust between member states, between member states and institutions. This has to be comforted. Let me say one thing which I think is uh, promising is the fact that after the um, agreement on next generation EU at the European Council, so the leaders in July 2020 and then uh, ratified by European Council uh, and uh, um, by the European Council, uh, the Parliament, etc., Member states have started to present programs. I was fearing, I have to say, that uh, uh, come these programs into the discussion with the other member states, there would be hostage taking or uh, delays or artificial pushing and pulling, etc. This has not happened. So actually, the programs like uh, uh, the Italy, France, uh, Spain, etc., they went through the through the council, so through the scrutiny of the, of the member states in a, um, in a very smooth manner. That was, I think, largely due to the fact that countries had taken their responsibility seriously and they interacted with the Commission in a very close uh, manner. So when the Commission came to the Council and supported the program, I think that was gain the trust of the, uh, I think, of the others. Now, this has to be comforted by proper use of the, uh, of the funds. I mean, take the case of Italy in particular. It is very interesting, and as Olivier mentioned before on, uh, on uh, you know, Mario Draghi, the present government, the one interesting element is the path of reforms and investment in Italy, which is, in a sense, defies the um, typical political uh, uh, incentives, because you have a front-loading of reforms uh, and a backloading of investment. Usually, if you look at political uh, dynamics, you get the opposite. You know, you get you know the easy, benign way of uh, you spend money at first, reforms maybe later. Hmm? Here they have inverted, and I think that is very important because many of those reforms take uh, on the judicial, on public administration, public procurement, etc., are preconditions to have an effective use of the funds. Uh, for on the investment uh, on the investment side, so I think this is uh, um, I think a promising element. Uh, we'll have to see whether um, uh, you know things in terms of implementation will be uh, then comforted. Uh, but I am reasonably optimistic that uh, I think we are on a reasonably good track. Let's hope that the overall uncertainty. Uh, would not derail, uh, uh, you know, the um, the focus uh, now. Uh, clearly, the economic situation is uh, uh, the re the bouncing back has been stronger than we had this considerably stronger than we had expected, you know. But these clouds now again on the um, on the epidemiological conditions uh, are uh, clearly, um, you know, something to be reckon uh, with. Uh, and here again, uh, I think it's very clear that um, unless uh, we get our acts together on the, um, uh, on the global front and, uh, you know, vaccinate the world, uh, I think we can do all we, all we are doing on the domestic side, but it's not going to be enough. Well, thank you so much, Marco. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you, Olivier. Uh, I'm very excited and appreciative that we have been able to engage, we, the Peterson Institute community, have been able to engage with you and your colleagues and Commissioner Gentiloni and Vice President Dombrovskis and you especially and the EU delegation in, in Washington for the last 10, 20 years through the crisis, through the launch of Europe. And I joined Carolyn Atkinson and Olivier Blanchard in admiring not just the fact that you were able to do such thoughtful writing and reflection during ongoing crisis and international coordination, but that you integrated that actually into the policymaking discussion. Um, and that's something I think we all can aspire to doing. So with that, um, recommending that everyone go to CPR and download or purchase uh, Marco's new book, The Man Inside, A European Journey Through Two Crises. I will declare this meeting adjourned. Thank you very much. Thanks, Adam.